Hello and welcome. Yes, I know it's been a while, but I'm back and I'm back with a bang. We have the OCR A-Level Paper 2 Complete Revision Lesson. Let's get started. First of all, we've got 2.1, Elements of Computational Thinking. This is a unit that some people skip over when they're revising. Please don't. There will be a few questions from here. There are some good marks to get. 2.1.1, Thinking Abstractly. Abstraction is removing unnecessary details and including only the relevant details. It is identifying what does and doesn't matter to solve the problem. Some examples of thinking abstractly include symbols on a map showing buildings, roads, etc., charting where an Oyster card is checked in and out of the London Underground, moving nodes on a graph data structure to change the visualization. In computer science, abstractions are used extensively for example, variables, objects, and data structures. Abstraction helps us maximize our chances of solving a problem by letting us separate out the component parts and deciding which are worth investigating. It may make a problem easier to understand, a system quicker and easier to use, or a problem easier to solve or program. Subroutines and libraries are good examples of abstraction, which leave our main program easier to understand and quicker to debug. It allows us to concentrate on what is important or one thing at a time. In a complex system, it is often used to construct an abstraction to represent a large problem and to create lower level abstractions to deal with the component parts. The power of this approach is that the details in each layer of abstraction can be hidden from the others. This frees up the solution process to concentrate on just one issue at a time. 2.1.2, thinking ahead involves planning inputs and outputs and reusable components. What you need before you get going. Examples of thinking ahead include working out how much paint you need before starting to decorate, getting all the tools ready for a DIY job in advance, getting everything packed in your bag before going to school in the morning. A special example of this is caching. Caching is when data that has been used is stored temporarily in case it is needed again. This could be storing data or instructions in RAM instead of secondary storage. A key point here, and this is something that students get wrong over and over again in my experience, is that caching does not equal cache memory. It is a similar word, but it's being used in a different context. Uh, cache just means a buffer. OK, does not exclusively refer to cache memory on the CPU. This could also be storing something in secondary storage rather than online storage. So, for example, caching web pages so that they can load faster. Caching allows for faster use in the future than fetching it from the slower storage media. However, caching can be complicated to implement. Another element of thinking ahead is making reusable components. One piece of code that can be used in multiple places and called multiple times. Reusable components can include the use of subprograms, the use of classes, the use of external libraries, but does require planning to be effective. Caching and reusable components are often compared and contrasted in the exam. 2.1.3 Thinking procedurally. This is breaking a problem down, uh, what we might refer to as decomposition. Examples include generating a subject grade requires putting marks into a system before applying a grade boundary, before printing results. This is when we identify a number of smaller subproblems and then determine the order of events. This may not be entirely possible with an event driven rather than a procedural approach to programming. 2.1.4, thinking logically, identifying the decision points for branching or iteration. So an example might be using flowcharts to design an algorithm. We have to think about the branching points and we have to think about when things need to repeat. This allows us to determine the complexity of an algorithm. It allows us to identify the points at which a decision is needed to determine the conditions of the decision, to determine the next steps depending on the outcome of that decision. 2.1.5, thinking concurrently. Identifying if parts of the problem can be tackled 
at the same time. An example might be baking a cake. We can prepare the icing while the cake sponge bakes in the oven. Concurrency speeds up the solution. However, this may be difficult to program, and not all problems suit concurrency. Not every problem can be split up and solved at the same time. Moving on, we're now at 2.2.1 programming techniques. So I'm not going to go through how to program because that's a whole set of videos. I'm just going to go through some of the key points from this list here. During this section, and indeed throughout this PowerPoint, I'm going to give you some examples of code. Now, to make this applicable to as most students as possible, I'm going to give it to you in pseudocode that's very similar to how you would get it in the exam, kind of OCR pseudocode, okay? I did think about giving it to you in C Sharp or Python or multiple different versions, but I think just giving you the pseudocode is probably the simplest way to help prepare you and teach you these key ideas. And we will start with sequence. When a set of program instructions or statements are written one after another, your code will be executed one statement at a time in the order that the statements are written in. An example might be doing a calculation or accepting some input from the user. This usually forms the bulk of the code in any program. So here we have a very simple program here in pseudocode, and it will clearly execute line by line in sequence. Branching. Uh, sometimes called selection. A program construction that allows a program to run a sequence of code depending on whether a condition evaluates to true or false. So that is a Boolean condition. For example, a login system that displays an error message if the password is incorrect. Selection will usually be carried out with if else or sometimes a variation of switch case. So here we have the same program using if else and switch case, the programs work in exactly the same way. Which one you use is entirely up to you. Generally, I kind of stick to if else, but you may see an example of switch case in the exam, so you just have to know that these are both the same. Iteration, when a section of code is repeated using a loop. The programmer specifies a group of statements to be repeated. This can be for a certain number of repetitions, or it can be controlled by a condition at the start or indeed the end of the loop. Iteration can be done with what we call count controlled or definite or condition controlled or indefinite iteration. Count controlled is the classic for loop. We know exactly how many times we want to loop before we get started. Condition controlled is typically a while loop. We loop until a condition is met. However, please be aware that we have the idea of the post-check condition controlled loop. Here at the bottom here, we've got an example with do until. The difference between a pre-check and a post-check is obviously the pre-check checks the condition before executing the statements. The post-check executes the statements first and then checks the condition. So the statements inside a pre-check might never execute if that condition is never true. Whereas even if the condition isn't true in a post-check, it may still execute once before it determines that it's incorrect. Next up, we have recursion. And everybody loves recursion, right? Recursion is simply when a function calls itself. It is another way of producing iteration and will often be compared to iteration in the exam. A recursive subroutine must have a way it can be executed and exit without needing to call itself. This is known as the stopping or exit condition, or sometimes referred to as the base case. Recursion is generally shorter and often said to be simpler to read and understand than the equivalent iterative solution. Whether that's true or not, whether you agree with that doesn't really matter. It's what they're expecting you to say in the exam. However, recursive algorithms are slower and use additional system resources compared to iterative ones. Also, badly designed recursive algorithms can cause stack overflow errors. So here we have an iterative and a recursive solution to count how many times a number is exactly divisible by two. It is important to note that both will have the same end result. They are the equivalent to each other. The iterative solution is quite simple. 
We've got the loop. We keep looping through the same bit of code over and over again. And when we're finished, we return that final value. If we have a look at the recursive function here, we know that it's using recursion because it's calling itself. And that's the bit I've highlighted there. So it will keep calling itself over and over again until this condition here is no longer true. When this condition is no longer true, it will skip over to that final return count here. And this return count is the stopping condition or the base case. But please remember, when it does return count, it's not returning it to like the final calling code. It returns it to the previous recursive function, then the previous one, then the previous one, as it kind of goes back through all the different recursions that have been called until it gets to the end. So maybe a way of making that a bit easier to understand and help you in the exam, often you'll get a recursive function and you have to basically write all the function calls and explain what will happen. Sometimes they give you a trace table, sometimes they don't. If they don't, just literally write the trace table. It's just a lot easier than trying to explain it in words. So we have another recursive function here. Uh, and all we're doing is giving it the value 5 and seeing what will happen. So if you look at that uh, function recursion just now, it takes in a value num. The base case, if that value equals num, it returns 1. So this is when it's going to exit without calling itself over and over again. If num is not equal to 1, then it's going to return the value of num multiplied by recursion num minus 1. So it's calling itself and passing itself the value num minus 1. And this will continue indefinitely until the value of num becomes 1, in which case it will unwind, pass through all the different recursive functions until it gets back to that original call. So how can we do that as a table? Because that sounds kind of complicated. Well, we have a look at our table. We're going to ignore that return column just now, and we're just going to concentrate on the function call and the num column. We're starting by calling recursion with the value 5. So the value of num is 5. Then we get to that line. Return num times recursion num minus 1. Well, if num is 5, we're going to call recursion with 5 minus 1, which is 4. So the next function call is recursion 4. The value of num is 4. Okay, we're not going to go to the stopping condition yet. We're going to go back to that line, return num times recursion num minus 1. So again, 4 minus 1 is 3. We're going to call recursion 3. Then recall recursion 2. And then call recursion 1. When we get to recursion 1, the value of num is 1. So therefore, we get to that line if num equals 1, the stopping condition. And then we're going to return 1 and we're going to unwind. This is the point where we move to the return column. And we go back up from the bottom to the top, explaining what the return value is each time. So obviously, first time, for recursion 1, we're returning the value 1. That's what it says there, return 1. OK, we go back up to the recursion uh, with the value 2 now. What is that line there? Return num times recursion num minus 1. So here the value of num is 2. And obviously recursion num minus 1, well, that's returning what? That is 1. So 2 times 1 is 2. And then we're going to go back up to the next function call. And it's going to be return num times recursion num minus 1. Well, for recursion 3, the value of num is 3. The value it's getting from that function call is 2. So 3 times 2 is 6. We go up to recursion 4. That's 4 multiplied by 6, which gives us 24. Then we go up to recursion 5. 5 multiplied by recursion num minus 1. Well, that is up to 120. Sorry, that's up to 24 now. So it's 5 times 24, and that gives us 120. Okay? So we do the function calls. We do the value of the value num. We go down, and then we unwind it by going back up and just completing it for each call one after the other. Now we're going to look at global and local variables. The scope of a variable refers to where in the program a variable or a constant can be accessed. The scope of a variable can be either local to a particular subroutine or global to the whole program. Global variables can be accessed throughout a program. They are declared or set outside of any subprogram, subroutines, functions, procedures, etc. Local variables are set or declared inside a function 
or other subprogram, and they can only be accessed from within that subprogram. You have to be careful with global variables. They can be dangerous in certain circumstances. It's easy to overlook them when they're changed, and they can make debugging your program quite hard. Modularity. Most programs are written in a procedural manner, which means we separate them out into subsections. This makes them easier to create and test. Subprograms can have various names. They might be called a subroutine, a function, or a procedure. These terms can have different meanings in different languages. From our point of view, we're just going to say we have functions and we have procedures. Functions generally return a value. I think we'll do, you know, again, some languages do it differently. They just call functions and procedures both functions. But generally, a function returns a value and a procedure does some sort of operation, but does not return a value. OK, and that kind of separates them out quite nicely. So we've got two examples here. We've got the function. We've got the procedure in pseudocode. The function is returning text. Whereas the procedure is doing something, but it's not returning a value. Sometimes subprograms need data to carry out their instructions. This is done by adding some variables, typically in brackets, after a subprogram name. These variables are called parameters. So in our pseudocode example here, procedure greetings, name is the parameter. Corresponding to each parameter in the subprogram definition is an argument in the subprogram call. So we look at that bottom line there, greeting name, it's the name of the procedure, and then our argument is the value we want to pass to our procedure. Now this gets more complicated because parameters can be passed in one of two different manners. We've got by value and by reference. By value is the default in many languages and is the default in your exam. So if you don't specify by value or by reference, the assumption is it's by value. Here, when you pass a parameter, a copy is made for the subprogram. So changing the value in the subprogram does not change the original value. However, by reference works differently. This means that the address of the variable is passed to the subprogram. In this case, if the variable is changed by the subprogram, it stays changed. So if you pass something by reference and you change it in the subprogram, even if you don't return the value, the value is changed inside the main program rather than just in the subprogram. Again, we've got a couple of examples. They're both procedures. The first one over here, we are passing by value. We're specifying by value. So that when we change the value of num, it does not affect the value of num right at the bottom here. When we print num at the end, it still displays 10, not 20, because we passed a copy of that value only. Whereas when we look at the procedure where we pass num by reference, when I update the value of num in the procedure, it also updates the same value in the main program. So in that final line, when I print num, I do get the value 20. IDE, or Integrated Development Environment. This is a comprehensive set of tools to develop programs. You need to know some of the common features of an IDE for the exam. They usually have some sort of code editor, usually optimized for one or more languages. Error diagnostics, such as tools for debugging. Step-by-step -step progression through a program to help find errors and debug it. A build feature that compiles and links with other needed parts of the program. It might offer version control. It'll have a runtime environment to allow the programmer to run the code and see the output in the IDE itself. And it'll have some sort of translation software. For example, a compiler or interpreter. Again, so you can run that program and translate it. Now we're on to object-oriented programming, or OOP. There are many different programming styles, known as paradigms, that can be used to create computer programs. One of these is OOP. Object-oriented programs define separate objects that have their own associated values, attributes, and subroutines, methods. This means that values and subroutines can be easily grouped together in a logical way. It's all the data that you need to store and all the actions that act upon that data stored together in one package. Object-oriented programming is primarily used because of the advantages of three of its core concepts. Encapsulation, which allows different parts of the program to be separated to make them easier to understand and work on. Inheritance, which allows different objects with slight differences to still share the same core code. And polymorphism, 
which allows subroutines to be flexible depending on what object is using the subroutine and what data is passed to it. As object-oriented programs can have many different objects, many of which share similar features, code does not need to be written to define the properties of each individual object. Instead, a template for a type of object known as a class is created. So a class is your template, a cookie cutter, that's used to produce objects. So let's have a look at how to create some basic code for an object-oriented programming using exam pseudocode. So first of all, we've got creating a class, declaring any attributes that we need, and building a constructor. So we start by naming the class. The keyword is class, and then the name is usually something that you'd get in the exam question. Then we list the attributes. These are like the variables that we're going to use in our program. Unless you're told otherwise, always make the attributes private. The private keyword denotes that they can only be accessed from within that class. They cannot be accessed externally. Then we're going to have any methods that we need, the sub-programs, the procedures and the functions. Generally, unless you're told otherwise, all the procedures, all the methods should be public, which means they are externally accessible from outside of the class. So here we have one method, and this is a very particular and important method called the constructor. We know it's the constructor because it has the keyword new in it, and that's what we use with pseudocode. Uh, different languages use different ways of doing that, but for pseudocode we're just going to use the keyword new. The constructor is what allows you to build new objects, so that when you call it from somewhere else, you can call the class, give it any values that it requires, in this case, give a name, set any of the attribute values, uh, create any default values that you need, and then you have your object. So a constructor allows you to create new objects of this type. Then underneath that, we've got a couple of methods here just to give you an example. We've got a procedure and a function. Methods are just like subprograms, subroutines that we've used before. Do they return a value or not? That means they're a procedure or a function. Generally, they're always going to be public. Note here we've got a set name and a get name function, a getter and a setter, just so that we can edit or access the name attribute from outside of the class. Some languages will give you automated ways of creating getters and setters. In the exam, you probably want to stay away from those and just create them in the old fashioned way here. To instantiate or create an object from another class, another program, we just do it like this. We give the class a name, just like we would to any variable. Again, you might be given that in the question. You might have to create it yourself. Just choose something sensible. Then we've got the new keyword that calls the constructor that we saw in the previous slide, the name of the class, in this case, pet, and then we give it any values that it needs to send to that class, in this case, the name Fido. If I want to call methods from another class once I've instantiated my object, it's pretty simple. We use the name that we gave the object when we created it. We add a dot, and then it's the name of the method plus any values that are required. So inheritance uh, can be a little bit complicated. You might get that in the exam, especially uh, part B of paper two. But the basic form isn't that difficult. Remember, inheritance allows a class to inherit all the methods and attributes of the parent or superclass, as well, as well as being able to define its own. So here we know dog inherits from pet because we're using the keyword inherits. Again, different languages use different ways to show inheritance, but using the keyword inherits is quite an easy way of doing that. We give it any unique attributes that are required. We don't have to have the name here as an attribute because that already exists in pet. We just need to have the new attributes that are unique to dog. Again, we have our procedure that is the constructor. Again, keyword new there. And you can see this is a little different from the original constructor because it takes in two values. Then here I've got the line super.new given name. And super is what we use in pseudocode to call the original superclass or parent class method. So here I'm using the original constructor inside the new constructor created for the dog class. Polymorphism is the ability to use the same code to process different objects according to their type. This is quite a simple example. I've created a pet object and a dog object. I've then put them in an array 
and I'm just going to cycle through the array and print the name of the pets. The, the reason this is an example of polymorphism is when I've used pet i.getName, I'm not specifying is it a pet, is it a dog, is it whatever class, I don't need to. Thanks to polymorphism, the appropriate name get name function is going to be called. And that's a very simple example of polymorphism. Okay, after that whirlwind tour through computational techniques, we're going to move on to 2.2.2, computational methods. First of all, problem recognition. The first step in solving a problem is to examine the description of a given scenario to identify the nature and parameters of the problem, undertake a thorough analysis of the current situation, specify the problem requirements or success criteria, identify whether the specifics of the problem allow it to be classified as a certain type of problem. Problem decomposition. An important step in tackling a complex problem is to decompose the problem into smaller subproblems that can be solved individually. In this way, the problem is divided into parts that are manageable to solve, test, and maintain. One way of doing that is what we call a top-down design. First, look at the problem as a whole and identify its main components, then systematically analyze these components further until you reach the basic building box of the solution. These freestanding modules can then be implemented using different methods, for example, as subroutines or classes. We could also use divide and conquer. This is a method for designing algorithms in which recursion is used to repeatedly divide a task into subtasks of an identical or similar type until an easy to solve subtask, the base case is reached, then the individual subtasks are combined to provide the solution to the main task. This approach is very common with searching, sorting, and pathfinding algorithms. The use of abstraction. So hopefully we remember this from earlier in this PowerPoint, but removing unnecessary details and including only the relevant details is the definition of abstraction. It's all about identifying what does and doesn't matter to solve the problem. Computer scientists have to choose what to include in the model and what to discard. They must ensure that they include the minimum amount of detail necessary to solve the given problem to the required degree of accuracy. Backtracking. An algorithmic approach to a problem where partial solutions to a large problem are incrementally built up as a pathway to follow, and then if the pathway fails at some point, the partial solutions are abandoned and the search begins again at the last potentially successful point. Backtracking algorithms often use recursion in order to move from one state of the problem to another. Backtracking is essentially trial and error. It is used extensively in some program approaches. So let's take a look at some examples of backtracking in the real world. Let's imagine your phone won't send an email. What might we do? Well, first of all, you might check that your Wi-Fi is enabled and that you have a signal. If that's all good, you might check your email settings. Still not working? You might reboot your phone. You keep backtracking through the stages until you try and find a solution. Another classic example of backtracking is chess. For each move that you make, you have to consider what the next move would be, and then the next move, and then the next move, and so on and so forth. Backtracking is good for solving logic problems and providing artificial intelligence algorithms. However, it's only useful for sequential problems. Data mining, the analysis of a large amount of data to provide new information. There may be no predetermined matching criteria. It is a useful way to search for relationships and facts that are not immediately obvious. An example of data mining might be a supermarket working out that nappies are often bought by men and then putting beer next to nappies to increase the sales of beer. Advantages can be gained if you spot unexpected trends and patterns. Heuristics, a best guess approach to problem solving to reduce computation time. Approximating solutions to ensure a balance between the time spent on solving the problem and getting to the best possible solution. An example of heuristics might be estimating traffic congestion when route planning. Can be used when it is unfeasible to analyze all the possibilities. However, it's important to realize when good enough is good enough and when it isn't. Performance modeling. Simulating or modeling the performance slash behavior of a system before it is used. 
or estimating the impact of change on an existing system or predicting the impact of change of workload on an existing system. Performance modeling examples include using sample test data on a new exam system rather than launching it on the day exam results are due to be published or using computer modeling on car designs before building physical prototypes to test in the wind tunnel. We can use this to predict outcomes in a manner that is cost effective, time saving and safety first. However, requires accurate data and randomization may be needed to model uncertainty. Pipelining, a computing technique where the output of one process can be fed into another. Complex jobs can be divided up into separate pipelines so that parallel processing can occur. This technique parallels real life situations such as an assembly line process. Examples of pipelining include a car manufacturing factory, in fact anything where you'd be using an assembly line, or in a computer separating the fetch to code execute stages uh, in a modern CPU. This can speed up the execution of a process, However, unexpected branches can mean that the pipeline has to be reset or flushed as the next process is no longer the one to be done next. Visualization, a representation of reality using symbols, charts and color. Problems in data can often be better understood when translated into a visual model. So examples might be using diagrams to represent programs, system diagrams, class diagrams, flow charts, etc or using graphs and charts in a spreadsheet. Data is more easy to read if it is presented in a visual way, and it may be easier to spot trends, patterns, and relationships between different types of data. Now we're on to the big one, 2.3.1 algorithms. There's a lot to cover here. I'll try and get through it as quickly as I can while still giving you enough detail, I hope, to be useful. In computer science, big O notation is used to classify algorithms according to how their runtime or space requirements grow as the input size grows. We have time complexity and space complexity. Time complexity indicates the time an algorithm takes to run in relation to the size of the input. This is important because computers consume electricity to run. A quicker program could solve more of the same problem or run more programs in the same amount of time. Space complexity refers to the amount of memory required by an algorithm to solve a problem depending on the size of the input. This is important because algorithms can run on cheaper hardware, less RAM. You can have a greater number of different algorithms running on the same hardware. Big O notation is a formal expression of an algorithm's complexity in relation to the growth of the input size. Hence, it is used to rank algorithms based on their performance with large inputs. If we know the expression for the number of steps an algorithm takes to execute, we can get the big O expression by removing all terms except the one with the largest exponent, removing any constant factors. So there are a whole group of notations you need to know. Let's go through them. The first is constant time. This describes an algorithm that takes a constant time, the same amount of time to execute, regardless of the size of the input data set. So an example would be accessing an element in an array by its index. So you look at this example here, it doesn't matter how big my array is, accessing index position two will take the same amount of time. Now we have ON, or linear time. This describes an algorithm whose performance will grow in linear time, in direct proportion to the size of the data set. For example, a linear search of an array of 1,000 unsorted items will take 1,000 times longer than searching an array of one item. An example of this might be looping through an array, or as we've just said, a linear search. Next up we have polynomial time. O n squared. This describes an algorithm whose performance is directly proportional to the square of the size of the data set. A program with two nested loops, each performed n times, will typically have an order of time complexity O n squared. The running time of the algorithm grows in polynomial time. An example of this would be a bubble sort and insertion sort, which we will look at later. And then we have the example here of the nested for loops, 
which would give you an example of polynomial time. Next up, exponential time. Describes an algorithm where the time taken to execute will double with each additional item added to the data set. The execution time grows in exponential time and quickly becomes very large. An example of this would be the Fibonacci sequence. There's some pseudocode for that at the bottom there, or a brute force search. Then we have logarithmic, which is O log N. The time taken to execute an algorithm of order O log N will grow very slowly as the size of the data set increases. A binary search is a good example of an algorithm of time complexity O log N. Doubling the size of the data set has very little effect on the time the algorithm takes to complete. Examples of that would be a binary search, a merge sort, a quick sort, and we'll look at some examples of pseudocode for all of those a little later on. So here are some complexity comparisons from the slowest to the fastest growing. Obviously, if you are a programmer and you're choosing an algorithm, you want something that grows the slowest in order to make your program more efficient. And again, here's another comparison of all the searching and sorting algorithms that we're going to look at in a moment. In the exam, I have seen tables like that as questions where you expected to fill them in. So it's well worth just kind of memorizing this. So let's look at some specific algorithms. We're going to start with searching algorithms. A set of instructions for finding a specific item of data within a data set. An effective search is one that will always either find the solution or determine that the target data is not present. And the two search algorithms that we need to know are linear search and binary search. Linear search is a method for finding an element in a list by checking each element in the list sequentially, one at a time. This can work for both sorted and unsorted lists and has the time complexity ON. The algorithm in English is for each item in a list, inspect each element to check if it is the desired value, if it matches you have found the item, if the algorithm gets to the end of the list without finding the next item, then it is not in the list. So this is an implementation of that linear search algorithm in pseudocode. Please remember the algorithms you're given in the exam may not be exactly as the same presented here. The key thing is for you to be able to identify the key components of a search rather than just rote memorize one example. Okay, so you can have a look through this, you can do some pen and paper examples, you can practice coding it in a language of your choice. These are all good ways of just learning how the basic function works. Binary search. Binary search works by dividing the list into each time until we find the item being searched for. This is much more efficient than a linear search, but for a binary search to work, the list has to be in order. It has the time complexity O log N. So in English, the algorithm works like this. Find the middle of the list. If the middle value is the target, you found what you're looking for. If the middle value is greater than the target, then discard the second half of the list. Repeat on the first half of the data set. If the middle value is less than the target, then discard the first half of the list and repeat on the second half of the list. And stop repeating once the size of our data set is zero because the item is not in the list. So here is the algorithm for doing a binary search. Now the key point for identifying this is that it's calculating the midpoint. If you see any code in the exam and it's calculating a midpoint like this, then we're probably looking at a binary search. Sorting algorithms. A set of instructions to arrange a set of data in a particular order could be ascending or descending. Please check the question carefully. Next up, sorting algorithms. A set of instructions to arrange a set of data in a particular order could be ascending or descending. Please read the question carefully. An efficient sorting algorithm is one in which you can sort a data set in a short amount of time. And there are four sorting algorithms that you need to know. Four, that's a lot. Bubble sort, insertion sort, merge sort, and quick sort. Bubble sort is one of the most basic sorting algorithms and the simplest to understand. The basic idea is to bubble up the largest or smallest item to the end of the list, 
then the second largest, then the third largest, and so on, until no more swaps are needed. Although it is simple to implement, it is quite inefficient compared to the other sorting algorithms, and is best used for smaller lists that are nearly sorted. It has the time complexity of O n squared. So that algorithm in English, compare the first two items of the list, swap these items if they aren't in the right order, continue this for the rest of the list. When you reach the end of the list, this is one pass. Keep repeating these processes, making one pass after another until you can do a pass where no swaps happen, then you know that the list must be in the right order. So here we have the algorithm for a bubble sort. And again, the key feature here is towards the middle, where we're using this temporary value to hold the list item so that we can swap it over without overwriting anything. If you see anything like this, you can probably determine that it is a bubble sort algorithm. Moving on, we have the insertion sort. The insertion sort algorithm splits the list to be sorted into two parts. You end up with a sorted sublist and an unsorted sublist. Initially, the sorted side just contains the first item in a list with everything else on the unsorted side. We move through the unsorted sublist and move each item to the sorted list and insert it in the right place. This is more efficient than a bubble sort as an insertion sort does not require multiple passes to check that the values are in order. This is especially useful for inserting an item at the correct place into a list of data that has already been sorted. The time complexity is O n squared, but if the list is nearly sorted, this reduces to O n. So in English, we loop through the list of data, we select the first unsorted item, we loop back through the sorted side of the list and shift the items to make space for the unsorted item, then we insert the unsorted item into the sorted list at the correct point. So this is the algorithm here that you can see in pseudocode. Merge sort. This uses a divide and conquer approach to split data up into individual lists and then merge them back together in order. Merge sort is an example of a recursive algorithm. That means it's a function that calls itself. The merge sort is much more efficient than either bubble or insertion sort it will sort a larger list in a quicker amount of time. However, it's not the best sorting method for nearly sorted or small lists. The time complexity is O n log n, but requires additional memory space for the merging process. So roughly in English, split the list until you end up with lists of size one, that's the divide stage. Then you move on to the conquer stage. This involves merging each pair of sublists by comparing the first value of each list and putting the values into the correct order. We continue merging until there's only one list at the end. So the algorithm here is getting a little bit more complicated. We can see here that it is a recursive algorithm because we call merge sort twice for both the left and the right. And finally, in terms of sorting algorithms, we have the quick sort. This is one of the fastest sorting algorithms. It is another example of a divide and conquer approach to problem solving. The quick sort method sorts a list by selecting a pivot value. To sort the list into ascending order, low to high, the list is partitioned so that the values lower than the pivot are moved so that they come before it, and the values larger than the pivot are moved so that they come after it. This creates two partitions. The process is repeated on the smaller and smaller partitions until the list is fully sorted, does not require additional memory space, and has a time complexity of O n log n. So that algorithm in English, take the first item in the list, make it a list one item big and call it the pivot, split the remainder of the list into two sublists, those less than or equal to the pivot and those greater than the pivot, recursively apply step two until all the sublists are pivots. The pivots can now be combined to form a sorted list.
So here is an example of the quicksort algorithm. You can see now we're getting really complicated. Uh, quicksort is quite complicated to implement, as you can see. And again, this is a recursive algorithm. You can see here that we're calling quicksort inside of quicksort. Now let's move on to shortest path algorithms. Often in modern life, we use computers to find the shortest path between two points. Often, this is the shortest path between two physical locations, for example, when we use Google Maps or a mapping application of your choice. But it could also be for other applications such as building circuit boards or internet packet routing. We implement this using a graph or tree. There are two algorithms that you need to know about, and these are Dijkstra's and A star. Starting with Dijkstra's. This is designed to find the shortest path between one particular start node and all other nodes in a weighted graph. This is similar to a breadth first search. And here is the algorithm in structured English. Now what I'm going to do is give you a kind of worked example just to make sure that's clear. So we start here with our unweighted graph with all the nodes and all the costs. We initialize a table of unvisited nodes. So in that table, we've got three columns. We have all the nodes. We have the cost from the start to reach each node. And we have a column of all the previously visited nodes. We're going to start with node A. So node A becomes the current node. And we're going to examine all the nodes that can be reached directly from A that are on the unvisited node list. In this case, it's B and C. The cost to reach B is 8, the cost to reach C is 5. Those are obviously less than infinity, so we're going to put 8 and 5 in the table as the cost. And in the previous node column, we're going to write A instead of none. We then move A from the unvisited list to the visited list and move on to the next step. Now we look at the unvisited list and we decide which node has the shortest path so far, that's C. So C becomes the current node. And then we examine the nodes that can be reached directly from C that are on the unvisited list, which is D and E. And you can see the total cost to reach D is 5 plus 6, which is 11. And to reach E is 5 plus 9, which is 14. So that goes into the list in terms of cost. And then we fill in C instead of none for the previously visited node. We then move C from the unvisited list to the visited list. Again, we look at the unvisited list table and we decide that B has the smallest cost from the start. So it becomes the current node. We examine the nodes on the unvisited list that can be reached directly from B. And that's only D. Remember, C's already been visited, but D hasn't. And we look at the cost. Well, the cost to get to D from B is 9. So 8 to get from A to B and 1 to get from B to D, total cost of 9. That's less than the cost of 11 that we already have. So we replace, replace the 11 with the 9. And then instead of saying the previous is C, we say the previous is now B. And then we move B from the unvisited to the visited list. Only two nodes left. D has the smallest cost. So it's the current node. We examine any nodes on the unvisited list that can be reached from D. That's only E in this example. The total cost to get to E is 11. 11 is less than 14, so we write that in. And we say the previous is now D instead of C because the cost is less. And then we move D from the unvisited to the visited list. The only remaining node in the unvisited list is E. There are no more unvisited neighbors to examine. Therefore, we can just take E and move it straight into the visited list column with the cost and the previous. We can now backtrack through the nodes to find the shortest path between them. So for example, to find the shortest path from A to E, we go from E to D, D to B, B to A. And we can say that the shortest path is A, B, D, E with a total cost of 11. A star is an alternative algorithm that can be used for finding the shortest path. It performs better than Dijkstra's algorithm because of its use of heuristics. Now remember, heuristics is a best guess or rule of thumb approach that can provide a good enough solution. 
This optimization obviously depends on the heuristic used. So it can return a non-optimal result, but the better the heuristic, the better the results. The A star algorithm focuses only on reaching the goal node, unlike Dijkstra's algorithm, which finds the lowest cost or shortest path to every node. A star is often used in video games for pathfinding for the enemies. I'll give you the algorithm here in structured English. You can always tell if it's A star because we're adding on this heuristic element to give us the total cost. And we're getting close to the end now, but we've still got quite a lot to cover. We've got algorithms for the main data structures. That's your stacks, your queues, your trees, your linked list, so on and so forth. Stacks, of course, are a last in, first out data structure. Data is added to the top of the structure. Data is removed from the top of the structure. To implement a stack, you need to maintain a pointer to the top of the stack, which is the last element to be added. The following operations are required to implement a stack. Push adds a new item to the top of the stack. Pop removes and returns the top item from the stack. Peak returns the top item from the stack, but does not remove it. Is empty tests to see whether the stack is empty and returns a Boolean value. Is full tests to see whether the stack is full and returns a Boolean value. Remember, the algorithms presented on the following slides may not be exactly the same as those given to you in the exam. You need to understand the key principles of each algorithm, not just rely on rote memorization. And again, these will be written in a type of pseudocode. They're not written as an actual implementation in a real programming language. First up, we've got the procedure for push. Start by checking if the stack is full. If it's not, add one to the top pointer. Take the item that we're given, add it to the top of the stack. Pop works very similarly. This time we're going to check if it's empty or not. If it's not empty, take whatever was on the top of the stack, get that ready to be returned, and then subtract one from the top pointer so we can keep track of how big our stack is. Then we have peak. Very simple. Again, we're not removing anything. We're not changing any of the pointer values. All we're doing is allowing us to take the item from the, the top of the stack. Is empty? Pretty self-explanatory. Is full? Pretty self-explanatory. Queues are a first-in, first-out data structure. New elements may only be added to the end of a queue, and elements may be only retrieved from the front of a queue. The sequence of data items in a queue is determined by the order in which they're inserted. The size of the queue depends on the number of items in it. The following operations are required to implement a queue. We've got to end queue, add a new item to the rear of the queue. DQ, remove the front item from the queue and return it. Is empty and is full, do exactly what they say on the tin. First up, let's look at the procedure to end queue. So we take in a new item. We check if the queue is full or not. If it's not full, we adjust the rear pointer. We add the new item to the rear of the queue and we increase the size by one. Then we look at dequeuing. Check to see if it's empty. If it's not empty, prepare an item to be returned, adjust the front pointer, and take one away from the size of our queue. And now we've got the isEmpty function and the isFull function, which work exactly as you would expect. Trees are a very common data structure in many areas of computer science and other context. Like a tree in nature, a rooted tree has a root, branches, and leaves, the difference being that a tree in computer science has its root at the top and its leaves at the bottom. One specific kind of tree is the binary tree, where each node can only have two branches, left and right. There are three ways of traversing a tree that you need to know about. Pre-order, in-order, and post-order. The names refer to whether the root of each subtree is visited before, between, or after both branches have been traversed. The tree traversal algorithms we'll look at are all recursive. There is a node class, because we're going to do this with OOP, used to create an object called node. To keep things simple and abstract away a lot of the detail that you don't need to know, Node has three attributes that are all public for convenience. Data contains the value. Left is the pointer to the left child node. Right is the pointer to the right child node. 
pre-order traversal. Each node is visited before the algorithm traverses either of the node subtrees. The algorithm, very roughly put, is visit the root node, do a pre-order traversal of the node's left subtree, do a pre-order traversal of the node's right subtree. So we've got an example here if you're not too familiar with pre-order traversal, and this kind of just takes you through how it would work. So again, remember what we have to do. We have to visit the root node, pre-order traversal of the left subtree, do a pre-order traversal of the node's right subtree, and this is how we would do it here. As you can see here, it's definitely recursive. In order traversal, each node is visited between each of its subtrees. We do an in order traversal of the left subtree, we visit the root node, and then we do an in order traversal of the right subtree. Again, there's an example here if you have forgotten exactly how an in order traversal would work. So again, we've got the code here. Again, do the left subtree, visit the root node, and then do the right subtree. Again, it's recursive. Post order traversal. Each node is visited after both of its subtrees. Do the post order traversal of the left subtree, do the post order traversal of the right subtree, and then finally visit the root node. Again, there's an example here. So here we've got the algorithm. You can see that we're doing the left subtree, then the right subtree, and then finally visiting the root node. Linked lists. A linked list is a dynamic data structure, which means the size of the list can change at runtime. You can imagine a linked list as a chain where each link is connected to the next one to form a sequence with a start and an end. Each element in a linked list is called a node. Each node stores the data relating to the element and a pointer to the next node. There's also a separate pointer that indicates the first element in the list, the head of the list. This has a null value when the list is empty. The next node pointer of the last element in the list always points to a null value to mark the end of the list. We will look at an implementation using OOP again, but a linked list can be implemented with dictionaries, arrays, etc. So here we have the class headers, constructors, and instantiation for what we're trying to do here. We've got the start of our node class, we've got the attributes and the constructor. We've got the start of the linked list class. Again, we've got the attribute and the constructor. And at the bottom there, we've got just how to instantiate or create a new linked list object. Okay, we want to traverse a linked list. We may need to go through each item in the linked list to find a specific element or print out each value, etc. So on the left here, we've got the methods that we require for the node class, a get data, a get next, and a set next method. And on the right here, we have the traverse method for the linked list class. Adding a new node. This algorithm allows us to add a node to the front of an unordered list. And obviously, if we want to add a node, we want to be able to delete a node. So this deletes a node from the linked list. So to delete a node from a linked list, you need to find it and then adjust the pointers so the node is no longer part of the list. You're not actually deleting the value, you're just changing the values of the pointers so it can be overwritten if needed in the future. And for our final topic, we've got the breadth first and depth first tree traversal. Remember, a tree is just a special case of a graph, and therefore graph traversal algorithms also apply to trees. A graph traversal can start at any node, but in the case of a tree, traversal always starts at the root node. Here we will consider a general breadth first and depth first tree traversal. So breadth first traversal is nice and easy. We start with a root node, we move down a level and visit all the root nodes in left to right order, or right to left, you know, read the question carefully, but left to right would be typical. And then we move down a level, repeat the process. So in this case, F, B, G, A, D, I, C, E, H. Breadth first, nice and easy. And then we have depth first, which is just a post-order traversal. We've already seen an example, nice and simple. We're just going to do A, C, E, D, B, H, I, G, and F. And there we have it, finished. I know I kept you guys waiting for a long time. I've tried to keep this fairly concise, but again, try and give you some decent pointers so that there's something that you don't quite understand. You know that you need to go off and work on it a bit more and do a bit of further revision. Again, hope this was helpful. A lot of fun recording it. 
great luck and hope you all get A stars in the exam.